Okay, welcome guys to today's session. Our session is on growing wealth steadily and sustainably with Make Sense. Um, we have Cindy here from Make Sense, who is the co-CEO and the financial specialist. Um, and Cindy works with millennials to help them overcome money stress, pay off debt, grow their wealth and achieve financial freedom. She believes that financial literacy is the ultimate tool to curating financial success and is on a personal mission to educate and empower her peers with these essential skills. So definitely, I am excited for this. I love Cindy's sessions. I've been her host for almost all her sessions. So um, I take pride in this. Get your notebooks ready and um, Cindy, take it away. We're excited for this. Awesome, thank you so much, Benita. I will go ahead and share my screen. I'm gonna keep the chat box open if you have questions. Uh, and for those who will be re-watching this video, Surely this is bound to bring up a lot of questions. So you can reach out to me in the inner village and I'll be happy to follow up and help you out. So let me get my screen on board. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, Benita, can you confirm that um, we got my screen shared appropriately? Yep, A-okay. -okay. Okay, awesome. All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about investing, how to do it, where to do it, and why you should. <laughs> All right, first and foremost, what does it actually mean to invest? Investing is different than savings. Let's make that very clear. When you are investing, you're putting your money into an account that you hope will allow your money to make more money and ideally increase in value. It's how you get your money now working for you. And so this is meant to be a bit more long term and for, you know, specific big milestones that you tend to be saving for, you know, most notably retirement versus saving you know, you're setting this aside in an account and you may be collecting some interest on it, but the main purpose is not to have that money, you know, grow for you. It's really, you're just adding to it to use in the short term. And so this is, you know, for things like an annual travel fund, your emergency fund, which you're, you might think short term. I mean, I don't know that the, an emergency might come up anytime soon. Well, that's exactly the point. When it comes to your emergency fund, you don't know if that's gonna happen in five years or tomorrow. It just happens to come up. Like none of us really expected the pandemic to happen the way it did. And so ideally you had a chunk of change sitting around ready and waiting for you to address an income shortfall. Because when it's invested, you know, when you're investing, that can come with some risks, which we'll touch on as well. So the primary difference, savings is short term, you know, you're putting money aside intentionally to use it in the near future. Investing, the long-term goal there is that you get whatever money you put in and hoping that that is gonna grow for you. So why is this important? I mean, the first line says it all. You wanna make your money work for you and not always just trying to work so hard for your money. And you're trying to build lasting wealth so that you don't have to work the rest of your life. You know, realistically, when you think about retirements and a lot of us have this, you know, arbitrary number of a million dollars, wouldn't it be nice to just have a million dollars? I think that'll make me comfortable by the time I retire. Well, what does it take to save up a million dollars of your own money? Quite a bit. It would take a lot from you, a lot of money set aside to set, to accumulate a million dollars in cash. But if you can just set aside maybe like 100K and then get that to grow into a million dollars over time, well, that's the ideal here. And so that's really why investing is so important to make those long-term milestones within our reach. Otherwise, we're breaking our backs to come up with the cash needed to do what we want to do. And, you know, for example, think of the millionaires and billionaires out there realistically, once you have that kind of wealth, they never have to work a day in their life again. I mean, that's already a lot of money, but when you get to that point, 
your money is earning so much more money for you that it's almost impossible to use it all up. As a billionaire, you'd have to spend millions and millions of dollars every single year to use up all your money. And even still, I saw a stat the other day that, you know, if Jeff Bezos wanted to use up his massive wealth, he'd have to spend uh, something insane like $150 million a year for like 300 years to use up all of his wealth. So he's at a point where his money is going to forever make money for him and he's never going to run out. I mean, we can all aspire to be a billionaire like our girl Riri, but you know, we'll take some baby steps in the meantime and uh, talk about some more realistic goals. So let's play this out in a scenario here. We got two friends, Abby and Alana, and they want to retire at 65. So when they first meet and talk about, you know, their ideas of investing, Abby is the more, you know, responsible person. She's like, yeah, I'm going to start today. I really want to get on this because I was told that, you know, if you start early, you're better off. Whereas Alana is like, okay, whatever. I'm in my 20s. I want to have a good time. I'll get around to it. No worries. I'll get around to it eventually. Okay. So Abby starts right away at age 25. And she's contributing $500 a month for 10 years. So she contributes until age 35. At 35, you know, she's going through some major life milestones and she's a little bit short on cash. And so she decides, okay, I've accumulated an amount of money by this point. I'm just going to let it sit and continue to compound uh, from my investment earnings. I'm just going to keep letting it grow for the next 30 years until I'm 65. So that's her strategy. She contributes for 10 years and then lets it grow. Alana, you know, the year Abby starts, Alana finally gets around to it. She's like, okay, I need to start now. I need to start saving. And she contributes the same amount, $500 a month. So that's $6,000 a year, except she never stops contributing. She contributes all the way to age 65 for 30 years. And yet at age 65, when they're both ready to retire, Abby ends up with a much larger pool of money than Alana. You know, you think about it, Alana saved three times as much as Abby. She put in 180K, 60K times 30 years. Um, she put in 180K, whereas Abby only put in 60K. But because Abby started early and then let that just sit there for 30 years and grow, that time spent, you know, 10 years prior at age 25 to 35 was really on her side. And you can see that, you know, this is a real scenario here where I played out with proper financial calculators. So I'm not just inventing these numbers. It may sound depressing and you might be thinking like, oh my God, but I am almost 35 and I haven't started investing. This isn't meant to depress you, but it is meant to illustrate a very important point. And that's that, you know, time really does matter. Time spent invested. And so even if you can start early and you feel like, you know, I might not be able to contribute much, but if I can just really focus and be a bit frugal for the next five years or 10 years to focus on building up at least, you know, a solid chunk of change, 50K or 100K, and then let that sit for the next 25, 30 years and let it grow, you might still be off in a very benefit be uh, left off in a very beneficial position as opposed to just trying to you know haphazardly catch up towards later in your life it's going to be a lot harder for you to end up in a similar position so we can see that abby's portfolio although she only put 60k in it grew by eight hundred and fifty two thousand dollars over the course of that 40 years you know 10 years actually spent contributing 30 years of just sitting there Whereas Alana was actively contributing for 30 years, she put in 180K and it grew by, you know, over half a million, which is nothing to scoff at. It's a lot of money, but the differences between them is pretty stark. So the best time to start investing was yesterday. The next best time to start is today. So the sooner you can get started, the better. That's one of the major, you know, one of the first major takeaways I would put out there for you is just get started as much as you can, whatever is available, 
put that aside now. Okay, so we know that we should invest. Where do you invest the money? Let's talk about the Canadian investment accounts available to us. There are three primary types of accounts. There's uh, non-registered, and then there are the two that we hear all the time, TFSA versus the RRSP. So your non-registered account, this is just your regular every, uh, everyday account. There's no special tax benefits to it. It's just your standard investment account. Even a, a regular savings account is technically a non-registered account. But then the CRA also introduced two special um, tax efficient accounts to encourage Canadians to invest and save. And that's the tax-free savings account and the registered retirement savings plan. So in the next couple of slides, we're gonna dig into the three of these and how they are different from each other. Starting with the non-registered investment account. So again, like I said, this is your standard account, no special benefits. It's offered by all banks, financial service providers and brokerages. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility because you know, there's no special advantages. So there's no reason to uh, place any limitations on you. So you always have access to the money. There's no locking in. There's no um, contribution limits or anything like that. But that's because, again, there's no shelter or protection or advantages when it comes to tax efficiency whatsoever. And so the three primary ways that you make money from investing is all taxable uh, every single year as you're accruing it. And I apologize in advance because I feel a sneeze coming. <laughs> So if at some point I turn away, <laughs> I apologize. Um, so those three main sources of investment income, number one, interest income. So whether it's an account that just offers an interest rate or you're invested in something that pays out interest payments like bonds, and we'll get into what a bond is later, that is taxable as regular income at 100% of your tax rate. And whatever interest you're accumulating is uh, taxable every single year because there's no sheltering from it. So at the end of the year, you know, some of you may receive something um, like a T5 tax slip from the government to file on your taxes. That's a tax slip for your investment returns. And that's going to include a summary of your interest income and your dividend income, et cetera. And on that note, the next way you can make money is through dividends. So dividends are provided when you're invested in stocks. And again, shortly we'll dive into the nuances of what a stock is and how it works. But the summary of it essentially is when you're invested in stocks, you have a share of a company. You're, you own a piece of that company. And the company owners, you know, when they have excess profits, and they want to incentivize their investors to keep investing with them, they may pay out a dividend. And so they'll use their excess profits and just kick aside an extra little sum, be like, here you go, thank you for investing. This is you know, an incentive to make our stock more attractive to you. So dividends, while they are taxable as regular income and at your full uh, tax rate, you actually receive an additional tax credit to reduce whatever taxes you owe. So it is at 100% of your tax rate, but then an automatic tax credit is applied. Uh, and usually that's about 15% of the tax owed, and that's refunded to you to lower the tax owed. So that is the next most efficient type of investment gain to have. But the most tax efficient type of investment gain is a capital gain. And what that is essentially is when you buy something at one price and then you sell it for higher, that's a capital gain. You buy your home for half a million, you sell it for 600K, you just made 100K, 600K, yeah. And then you just made a 100K capital gain. But capital gains are taxed very efficiently at half of your rate. So in that scenario, you know, using your home is actually a bad example because in Canada, uh, when you sell your principal residence, there's actually no taxes whatsoever. So that's a special exception 
uh, where when you sell your home, you don't have to pay taxes on it if it's your principal residence. But more commonly in terms of, you know, regular investing, how do you get a capital gain? Well, again, this reverts back to something like a stock. If you buy a stock at one price, let's say the share was worth $50, and then you sold it when the share was worth $100, you made a $50 capital gain, but it's taxed at 50%. So the $50 isn't taxable, only $25 is. And that, again, is, is to incentivize us to invest in companies, to invest in stocks. So again, um, there are all these types of in incentives to encourage us to support businesses and buy shares of businesses, because it is one of the primary ways that companies make money and raise funding is by going public and selling shares. So now let's dive into the TFSA, tax-free savings account. And first and foremost, although it's in the name, the word savings account, this is not a savings account. It shouldn't be used as a savings account. This is an investment account. And the reason why is that the primary benefit of your TFSA is that when your money goes in, there's no upfront benefits. So you don't get any sort of tax deduction or anything for putting money into it upfront. But once it's in the account, 100% of that growth is completely tax-free. So now we're saying that in the TFSA, it literally doesn't matter if you're earning interest or dividends or capital gains, it doesn't matter because none of it is taxable. It is the ideal place to start your investing journey. And you really want to be able to max out this account first and foremost, likely before prioritizing your RSP. There are, of course, you know, nuances and reasons why you might choose an RSP over a TFSA, which we'll get into as well. But for the most part, you know, the TFSA is the account you want to prioritize for the bulk of your investments. So really you're using this account to save for anything really, whether it's you know, a bit short term, medium term or long term, um, whatever it may be, this is a great account to invest. And the primary reason to put it in there is that you don't wanna pay taxes on any growth. And it's very flexible. You know, when you need to access the money, there's no withholding taxes that you have to deal with, no lock-ins, you're able to access it right away. So we can see in this image here how it works. Let's say you have 100K a year income. And, and I see a question here from Kalisha, so I'll answer that shortly. Um, you have 100K a year income and you put in 10K. Okay, well, you put in 10K, but there's no upfront benefit. So that year you're still taxed on 100K of income. But the money you put in there, that 10K, that eventually grows to 50K, five years later, or whatever it may be. And so now you're pulling out that full 50K because you need the money for whatever it is. There are absolutely no taxable consequences when you pull that money out. That means that $40,000 of growth, that is completely tax-free. The CRA does not even need to know about it. So you don't receive one of those T5 slips that I mentioned earlier because there's no tax reporting to be done. It is completely tax free. So let's look at the question here. With the benefits of the TFSA, does it make more sense to use it as a retirement fund instead of the RSP? That's an excellent question. It can definitely also be used as a retirement fund. If you find yourself in a position where you're not really in need of reducing your taxable income via the RSP contributions of friends, then yeah, Use it to save for your retirement and then know that you can draw on this money easily for other purposes, whether it's go back to school or I want to use it for a down payment or I just had a kid and I have to buy all this stuff or I want to save for my kid's education or I want to buy a car. I want to go on a trip. Literally doesn't matter. You can continue to invest in this TFSA indefinitely. There are no time limits on it. There are for the RSP. There is a maximum age that you can contribute into the RSP, which we'll get into. 
So I hope that answers your question, but yes, use it for retirement. Yes, use it for the trip. Yes, use it for whatever else, but make sure it's invested. Because again, back to my original point, number one here, you know, it's so attractive that all of these investment gains are completely tax-free. So what if it's not invested and you're using your TFSA just as a regular savings account and you just got cash sitting in there, which I see often. Many of my clients, when I start with them, they tell me about all this money that they put in the TFSA and then I ask them, great, what is it invested in? They're like, oh, I mean, it's invested in a TFSA. I'm like, right, right. But what is it invested in within your TFSA? Like, oh, um, I don't know, nothing, I guess. So let's be clear. The TFSA is an account type. It is the bucket within which you dump your investments. The TFSA itself is not an investment. That's like saying, oh, I'm invested in various checking accounts. You're not invested in the checking accounts. I mean, sure, a checking account can pay you some peanuts and in interest, but you're not invested in the checking accounts. You want it to be specifically invested in things like stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds. And you can have multiple TFSAs and RSPs through several banks or brokerages, but you want it to be invested in an investment product. And I see a little laugh from Benita here that that's her. Benita, you got to invest that money, girl. Because again, the primary benefit of your TFSA is the fact that it, all growth is tax free. So think about this if you're paying tax on your 100K a year income, and you're putting 10K into your TFSA, and then it's not invested, well, what's it being sheltered from? Because once you've paid your income taxes on that money, you know, the fact that it's sitting in there, nothing more would trigger a taxable consequence unless that money grew further. So if this was in a non-registered account, if that 10K grew any more, well, that's a taxable consequence that we have to deal with. And we like our registered accounts, TFSAs and RSPs, because they provide ways of sheltering that growth. And so if it's not growing, there's nothing to be taxed anyway. So you've just used up your contribution room within your TFSA for nothing. You might as well just have it sit in your checking or a regular high interest savings account. So yes, if you're using your TFSA, invest it, invest it aggressively because you know the more it grows, the better because the CRA is not seeing any of that tax from you. Now, on the flip side, we got the RSP, Registered Retirement Savings Plan. Again, not really a savings account. It is intended as an investment account, although even if it's not invested, I'll clarify, you are receiving a benefit. So you're not doing wrong by yourself by not investing within the RSP. Granted, you should invest because if it's in your RSP, this is not as flexible of an account as the TFSA. There are some bars to accessing this money um, and it is very much intended for retirement, it's in the name. So if it's gonna be in there long-term anyway, you might as well have it invested and have that money work for you. You wanna be an Abby and not an Alana and get that money growing for you. So you can just sit back and be like, cool, I got this money in there. Don't need to think about it anymore. It's growing on my behalf. So this is ideal for long-term savings. Um, it provides a temporary tax shelter. So it's tax deferred, not tax free. Let's touch on that. So the primary benefit of your RSP is that you get an upfront tax deduction. What do I mean? So, okay, same scenario where you make 100K a year income. Your contributions into the RSP are dependent on what you're earning. So every single year you earn additional contribution room into your RSP based on your income. It is 18% of your income up to a certain threshold. So, you know, 18% of your income up to 27K, 27K representing that 18%, you know, max threshold that they'll hit. And that accumulates over time. So ever since you got your first job and you started filing taxes at the tender age of 16 or whenever it was, I was 15 when I got my first job at No Frills <laughs> and I started filing taxes. That's when I started earning contribution room. 
The TFSA is a fixed dollar amount that applies to everyone equally across the board. And as long as you're 18, then you start earning that room. Whereas the RSP, not dependent on your age, only dependent on your income. So the RSP contribution room is subjective. Not everyone is going to earn the same amounts. The TFSA contribution room is objective. Everyone earns the same dollar figure amounts of contribution room every single year. So, okay, back to my point. How does this tax deduction feature work? You have 100K of income. You happen to have enough wiggle room that, yeah, okay, I throw the full 18K, uh, the 18% that I earned in contribution room, I throw that all into the RSV. So what happens? Well, that $18,000 you put into the RSP gets deducted from your taxable income. So now you're not paying taxes on 100K, you're only paying taxes on 82K, right? If we go back to this situation, the TFSA, you earned 100K and you contributed 10, that's nice. You're still paying tax on 100K. So upfronts, no benefit. Long-term, big benefits. TFSA, upfronts, tax deduction. But eventually, so let's say it grows to 60K, this 18,000 grows to 60K. This is tax deferred, meaning that eventually when you take it out at retirement, all of it is taxable, every single dollar of it. So it's like saying the CRA is giving you a tax discount today, but they're like, okay, but we want our money tomorrow down the line. And the TFSA is being like, no upfront discount for you, but okay, fine. When you want the money, we'll waive the taxes. So it pretty much works in the opposite way. But there's a lot more going on with the RSP, which I wanna dive into. So again, I mentioned the fact that it's deferred, not tax-free. So, you know, back to what I touched on where I said, okay, technically, if you didn't invest the money, you are still getting a benefit because the money that goes in initially, you are going to get deducted from your taxable income. But remember, I said that it's tax deferred. So if you're getting a tax break, we'll call it a little tax discount on $18,000, but it grows to $60,000. It's like, okay, thank you very much, CRA, for this discount on 18K. But at retirement, you're going to charge me taxes on 60K. Granted, no one's going to deplete their entire RSP all at once, slowly going to make withdrawals over time. But overall, typically, when it's invested and the money is growing, you're going to end up paying taxes on more money overall than you got a discount on when you put it in. So technically, you get your discount, putting the money into your RSP, and you don't invest it, well, then you're paying taxes on that same amount you got the discount on later in life. I'm using discount here loosely. It's called a tax deduction, not a discount, just for the sake of analogy here. But having said that again, that's not me saying, oh, well, the RSP is a scam because you're going to pay more taxes on more money than you get a deduction on putting the money in. You know, Ultimately, you're weighing the pros and cons of what is more important to me right now. Is it respecting my cash flow today and reducing my tax bill today? And you're doing that by contributing to your RSP. Or am I not really worried about taxes today because my employer takes a sufficient amount and I'm not self-employed? Um, then you might want to prioritize a TFSA. Because tomorrow or down the line, when you're taking out that money and it's grown quite a bit, you don't want to deal with taxes then. So yes, you'll get a benefit even if you don't invest it in your RSP. But again, I stress that this is an account that's intended for the long term. And so you might as well have it invested. Make that money grow for you. Make it work for you so you're not always working for it. Kalisha, is there an income bracket that gets more benefits in using the RSP? In general, you know, the higher your income, the more attractive it becomes to use the RSP in general. So there isn't a specific bracket where once you hit it, it's like, ding, you should be using the RSP. 
it's still a matter of, okay, we know that as your income gets higher, your overall between the federal rates and the provincial rates combined, like once you're hitting the, I would say 130K plus in income mark, you're paying like 45 to 50% in taxes, which is bananas. And so you might feel like, well, I don't want to just pay half my income in taxes. And that might be a point where you're like, okay, I'm definitely going to prioritize my RSP. And I haven't contributed all these years. So all these years I've accumulated all this room, which is ben beneficial to me now because my income is so high. I want to dump a lot of money in there every year to lower my tax bill. Because if you're in something like, if you're earning 30K a year, for example, uh, I don't know off the top of my head what the bracket is, but your average tax rate might be something like 15%. Well, you're not really too worried about saving taxes because you're not taxed very heavily anyway, but maybe you're making 30K and sure, your tax bracket is low, but you're an entrepreneur. And all of that is freelancer money, which is not having any tax deductions being withheld at source. And so at the end of the year, you're like, oh, I've got this like $3,000 that I owe, even though I didn't have a high income earning year, the fact that you're an entrepreneur nonetheless faces you with usually an inevitable tax bill at the end of the year. So if you have extra money lying around, you might find it beneficial to put it in your RSP anyway to lower that tax bill for yourself. So you're welcome, Kalisha. Um, so yeah, you don't really wanna withdraw this money until retirement. Because if you do, there are withholding taxes applied, depending on how much you take out, anywhere from 10 to 30%. So let's be clear, by withholding tax, this is not a penalty that's levied on you. So it's not like they're taking 10 to 30% for no reason, it's just a penalty. No, it's again, they're taking taxes ahead of time, making sure that the CRA is gonna get the taxes that will inevitably be owed, on that money. So when you file your taxes, you know, maybe what they withheld is too much, in which case you get a refund for it, or maybe you still owe, owe more taxes. But the point is they take it up front in that source. So like I said before, this is not an ideal account for money that you need in the near future. Because first of all, when you make a withdrawal, you don't get that contribution room back. You do for the TFSA. So going back to the fact that I kept stressing, this is an amazing account, it's super flexible, use it to save for anything. Because yeah, when you put money in there and then you take money out, all the money you take out of your TFSA dollar for dollar, you get that contribution room back in the following year. So it is very much intended for this, okay, money in, hit a milestone, great, money out, money in, money out, money in, money out. You keep getting that contribution room back. So you can continue your investing journey. The RSP is not intended to be this revolving door of you know, money in, money out. It is intended for RSP. So if you do take money out, first of all, you're gonna get hit with withholding taxes and then you're not gonna get that contribution room back. But there are other ways to access your money that is non-retirement related and don't involve withholding taxes. And that's the home buyer's plan or the lifelong learning plan. And you might've heard of these plans before. Essentially, what you're doing, you're not really withdrawing the money, you're borrowing your own money. So with the home buyer's plan, you can borrow up to 35K of your own RSP savings, but they expect you to put it back in the account. Because the CRA is like, okay, hold on. We gave you that upfront tax deduction. We want you to, afford the home. We want you to be incentivized to go back to school. So here you can borrow your own money and not have to pay taxes just yet, only if you put it back in the accounts. So with the home buyer's plan, you get 15 years to pay it back. And what you owe is 1 15th of what you took out uh, in total. And with a lifelong Learning plan, it's 20K payable in 10 years. So in this case, uh, the mental math is a little easier to do. If you take out the full 20K, you have to pay it back in 10 years. So 20 divided by 10, that's $2,000 that you would have to put back in your RSP each year for 10 years. You can always put back 
uh, like pay it off quicker, that's totally acceptable. But this is the minimum threshold is you have to pay one tenth of what you took out over the course of 10 years. And in the case of the HBP, one fifteenth of what you took out over the course of 15 years. Okay, so we touched on this a little bit, but which account should you invest in? Which do you prioritize? Well, we have a little bit more of a easier comparison via this chart. So let's compare the two, the TFSA versus the RSP. How do we earn contribution room? Like I said, TFSA is objective. It's a fixed dollar limit. RSP is subjective. It's dependent on your income. And $6,000 is the current annual contribution room. So every single year, we get an extra 6K that we can add in there. Every few years, they do adjust it according to inflation. They'll round it up to the nearest 500. So uh, as I understand, for 2022, we are still slated to have another $6,000 uh, contribution room limit added to our total lifetime limit. But eventually, you know, with inflation, that's going to go up to 6,500 and then eventually go up to 7,000. Um, and again, this can accumulates over time. So if you've never made a contribution into your TFSA, you've never even opened a TFSA, it's not like, okay, you opened your first TFSA this year and you only have 6K to add. No, by virtue of, so the TFSA was launched in 2009. By virtue of simply being 18, you start accumulating that room, whether you have a TFSA open or not. So as long as you were 18 in 2009, when this first got launched, your total lifetime limits, all of those annual limits added up, it'll be about 77,500. Give or take a bit, depending on your age, give or take, depending on whether you've made withdrawals and so contribution room gets added back or not. But right now, if you were, 18 in 2009, you've never opened a TFSA and you just opened one today, you will be starting off with $77,500 of total contribution room. And the RSP, again, if you're just opening up an RSP for the first time, is 18% of your taxable income ever since you first filed taxes for the very first time. That room carries forward indefinitely for the TFSA, like I said. So maybe you're like in, in your 50s when you first start investing. Maybe you don't even use your TFSA until you're in your 80s. It doesn't matter. That contribution room keeps adding up. You can use it whenever. But I mentioned that the RSP does have a time limit. Why does it have a time limit? Well, because the CRA gave you the tax break up front but they're patiently waiting and holding their breath until they can get what's theirs and they want their taxes one way or another. So they're like, okay, you have until the age of 71 to turn this into, at this point, it'll be called a RIF, R-R-I-F, Registered Retirement Income Fund, which is essentially just the opposite of the RSP where you have to take a minimum amount of money out every single year. And yeah, minimum amounts have to come out based on a percentage. Um, because it's designed such that when you convert it into a RIF and start drawing on your money in retirement, these percentages, the minimum amounts, will be set up such that it's designed to be fully depleted by the time you hit around age 98 to 100, because the CRA wants to make sure that every last dollar comes out of that account before you die so that they are getting their taxes. Gave you the tax break up front, but they are holding their breath until you pay taxes eventually in retirement. TFSA is the opposite. They're not giving you any upfront deductions, but that money can grow to an absurd amount. Doesn't matter how much it grows, CRA is not gonna see a single dollar more of taxes from you on it. And that's why there are fixed dollar limits. They don't want you just dumping like millions of dollars into a TFSA and never paying taxes. That's not fair. So they do cap it at specific dollar amounts. Uh, again, we talked about the contribution, tax deductibility, and the treatment of growth. So whether you prioritize one or the other, dependent on a few factors, age is one of them. If you're quite young, it makes sense to use the uh, TFSA because chances are, if you're young, you're not, you know, in your peak 
career and income earning years. So your tax bracket is already pretty low and chances are you're not paying high taxes, if any. And so you're better off just putting it in the TFSA uh, because you're young as well. And chances are you're going to need that in the near future for something like moving out into your new home, getting married or having a kid, whatever it may be. So the younger you are, the more sense it makes to use the TFSA first, dependent on your income. So again, Kalisha touched on that with her question. Is there a certain bracket where it makes sense? Well, in general, the higher your income, the more attention you're going to be paying to how much uh, taxes you're handing over to the CRA. So the higher your income, the more you're being taxed, the more it might start to make sense to, okay, maybe a portion of this I want to put into my RSP so I can lower my tax bill this year. Also dependent on the purpose. And to that, I'll say, essentially, if it's not retirement related, put it in your TFSA. Nothing else should be going into your RSP unless it's retirement related. But again, to Kalisha's point, an excellent question, should I use my TFSA to invest for retirement? Yeah, you can still use it for retirement. But what I'm saying is that specifically, the RSP is designed for retirement. The TFSA can be used for whatever very, very flexible. And then finally, your timeline. And to that same thought process there, RSP designed for retirement, we're talking about a long timeline. So it's ideal for that. It's not ideal for short term needs, you probably want to put it in a TFSA if it's going to be needed within the next, you know, 20, 10 years, five years. Okay, so we talked about why you should invest. We talked about um, investment accounts. And so my second takeaway, primary takeaway from that is TFSA all the way, ladies. Prioritize your TFSA for the most part, whatever your situation is. Of course, the nuances do matter and your specific situation does matter. Again, you know, I said, if you're, if you're young, use the TFSA, but if you're a young entrepreneur who owes taxes, then maybe you do want to use your RSP. So the nuances do matter, but for the most part, my takeaway here is that you should, you'll probably be better off to prioritize maxing out your TFSA first, then your RSP, and then non-registered accounts are always the final thing you wanna put money in because there's just no sheltering it. You pay taxes all along the way. Okay, so let's talk about investment products. I'm gonna start with stocks. We've all heard of stocks. I touched on this briefly already. What is it? You're literally buying a share in ownership of a company. So Facebook is a public company. They put themselves out there. They wanna raise capital. So they're selling little bits and pieces of their company to investors. And the capital that they're raising is the cost that you're paying to buy a share of that company. So as the value of the company increases, the stock price increases. So now if you want to buy a piece of that company, you know, the buy-in is much larger. And so these companies can continue to raise capital for themselves as they're doing well and growing because their stock price is going to go up and people keep buying in. But there are a lot of factors that affect the price of the stock. You know, company news and performance. Things like, let's think back to the Facebook scandals with Mark Zuckerberg around the security and breaches of security that took place. For a while, Facebook stocks plummeted in value because bad news uh, leads people to freak out. And so they were selling their shares and that was pushing the price down. You know, it's supply and demand. There was less demand because people wanted to get rid of it. And so the price was going down. And on that note, you know, bad news leads to bad emotions and how we feel about that stock. So, you know, even just investor sentiments affects, oh, and that's, you know, the third aspect here. Investor sentiment affects the price of a stock. If people are not feeling very good about Amazon stock because of all this news of Jeff Bezos spending his billions to go into space, like, great, you could save the world or fly your own personal rocket into space. Hmm. That upset a lot of people. You know, people don't really like to see him using his wealth that way. And I know a lot of individuals started to boycott 
Amazon and they just didn't want to support him anymore and they stopped buying it and people are not feeling good about the company and they start to sell things. Well, that can also drive down the price of the share when people are just overall not feeling very great about your company or they love it. The news is good. They're feeling really great about what you're doing. And so that is creating demand and that's pushing up price further. So that's pretty wild to think that the value of your company can be affected literally by whether or not people like you or not. And that's why stock investing is one of the most risky things you can do. Of all the different products that we're going to discuss, it's at the very top of, you know, what is quite risky because there's so many factors that can affect the price, including things that have nothing to do with, you know, the fundamentals of the company, you know, the financial fundamentals of Amazon, for example, could be great on paper. And it's like, yeah, this company looks like it's doing really well, lots of profits. But if the people don't feel good about your company and don't like it, it doesn't matter that your fundamentals are good. The price will drive down if they don't like it. So that's something that you need to consider when stock investing. A lot of different factors can affect the price. And then there's bonds. Bonds are something that most people are like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what it means. I know that you know retirees uh, have it in their investment portfolio. What is it? Well, when you buy a bond, essentially you're lend you become a lender. So governments and companies issue bonds again to raise capital for themselves. And what happens is if you're buying a $10,000 bond, for example, you are essentially lending $10,000 to that government or company. And in return, you're receiving interest payments. So again, I noted, okay, you could receive interest income uh, from your investments. Typically that comes through bonds, which are often just referred to as a fixed income product. And so you become a lender to that company. And eventually, you know, when you sell your bond, you get your money back, great, and you walk away with those interest payments. So bonds themselves, I had alluded to the fact that retirees tend to have more bonds in their portfolio. Why is that? Because unlike a stock, there aren't a lot of factors that will manipulate the value of the bond. The only factor that might manipulate the value of a bond are the prevailing interest rates. So, you know, the Bank of Canada interest rate, if you're buying a bond, the interest payments that you receive, let's say, you know, when you first bought it, it was negotiated, okay, this is a 6% interest rate bond, great. And then all of a sudden, you know, the overall interest rates in Canada go down to something like 4%. Well, now your bond is very attractive because it's paying a 6% interest rate. So when you go to sell it, you'll likely sell it for higher than what you bought the bond for because this is now a more attractive bond because its interest rate is higher than the prevailing rates. So the only thing that affects the value of a bond are overall interest rates. And there's an inverse relationship. As the overall interest rates go up, um, like economic interest rates go up, the value of your bond goes down because now the value of interest rates overall are higher than what you uh, bought the bond for the interest rates of that bond. But if the overall interest rates are going down then the value of your bond increases because it's paying out a higher interest rate than prevailing interest rates. So two ways you make money off of this, just collecting those interest payments, buy and hold, collect the interest, or you're buying it, interest rates in the economy change, and then you sell it for a profit. Okay. And now we get to ETFs, which are called exchange traded funds and mutual funds. The word fund got cut off there, but you know what I mean by that. Uh, and essentially what these are, are a pre-made collection of stocks and bonds neatly grouped up into one single product for you. And so by bundling all of these different stocks and bonds together into one little package, it's already a less risky option because think about it. Actually, I'll go to my next slide to illustrate a little better. ETFs and mutual funds are essentially like little gift baskets 
holding a bunch of different stocks and bonds within it. And now I'll say for the record that, you know, although there are only six items listed within this, most ETFs or mutual funds have anywhere from like 50 to 100 different products inside of it. So there are ETFs and mutual funds that could be just all stocks. They could be just all bonds. They could be a mixture of both with various allocations. But think about it like this. Let's say you want to get into stocks, but you're not a stock picker and you're worried about making the wrong choice because like we said, stocks are very finicky. They could, a lot of different factors could affect the value. Because if you buy one single stock in like Amazon, for example, you're placing a bet on the success of that one company. And if that one company does poorly and you made a bad call, it sucks. What can you do about it? But let's say you want to get into stocks and instead of buying Amazon, you buy yourself, you know, a tech ETF or a tech mutual fund, which has Amazon, which has Facebook, which has Netflix, which has, you know, whatever, many different companies within it. Let's say 50 different companies within it. Well, now if that one company, Amazon, does poorly, you're not very worried because guess what? There's 49 other companies within that one ETF or mutual fund, which are gonna prop up and support you know, the value of that ETF or mutual fund for you. So if one company does poorly, it's not to say that you're going to hit, face a huge loss because you're already so diversified within that one product that it evens things out to be a smoother ride for you. Okay. Diversification is very, very key. And it's one of the best ways to minimize your risk is by not exposing yourself to just one thing. Again, just one stock, you're really hinging the success of your portfolio on the success of that one company. But even if you only have one ETF or one mutual fund, within that are many, many different companies. And so you've already done yourself a service by being diversified in that way. So if you're new to investing or you're nervous about investing, um, I would choose either one of these products ETFs being the more approachable of the two. But what are the differences between these two? Well, let's start, um, let's start with stocks at the top. They, like I said, it requires a lot of research because you're placing a gamble on the success of that one company. It is the highest risk of these four things that we discussed uh, because there are so many things that can affect the value of it and it could drop drastically one day is because people decide they just don't like it. Some bad news comes out, there's a scandal, whatever it may be. So it's not suitable for a novice investor. If you're just getting started out, do not go stock picking. Bonds, very, very low risk. Um, I would have preferred this to be sort of uh, laid out from highest risk to lowest risk, but that's my bad. I should have designed this a little differently. I would say of these four things, bonds should actually be at the bottom as one of the lowest risk options. Cause again, you don't really have much that's affecting the value of your bond, but granted it's, it'll likely not grow a lot in value. The benefit there is those steady uh, interest payments that you'll receive. So retirees like that because they can just live off of those interest payments, you know, maintain a certain value of their portfolio and never really have to draw from the actual capital they put in and just receive those interest payments. So very low risk. And then next I would say is mutual funds, ETFs being less risky than mutual funds, bonds being the least risky. And the reason ETFs are less risky than mutual funds are because they're more passive. So that's the primary difference between ETFs and mutual funds. And what I mean by that is that with an ETF, what it does is essentially mimic certain indices. You know what an index is, we've heard of the NASDAQ, for example, the S&P 500. These are, an index is a collection of different companies on a stock market that represent a certain something. So S&P 500 represent the 500 biggest companies within uh, America. And so, ETFs tend to mimic various indices, whether it's like there's 
uh, a tech index that follows all tech funds, a healthcare index, whatever it may be. And so essentially when you buy an ETF, you're buying a piece of the stock market itself and mimicking it and you're sitting back and being like, cool, I wanted to get into the stock market. I'm literally gonna buy the stock market and then sit back. There's no active buying and selling occurring within an ETF, not like a mutual fund. So a mutual fund is a strategic collection of companies and bonds that isn't just passively trying to mimic something and index that already exists. There is a whole team of people behind a mutual fund, the fund manager and his team of analysts that are making very uh, researched and educated decisions about what are the best companies to buy. When should we buy them? When should we sell them? So there is, it is actively managed. So they are constantly buying and selling companies within this mutual fund because they're not trying to mimic the market. They're trying to beat the market. They're trying to get you better returns than simply just being passive and mimicking it. And that's why, you know, mutual funds kind of get a bad rap because they have higher fees. And it's for this reason because they're trying to beat the market. And so while an ETF might have fees of like half a percent, a mutual fund could have fees of like two and a half to 3%, maybe even more. And you get a lot of propaganda ads out there, you know, pushing against mutual funds. It's a waste of your money. To that, I'll say, you know, don't just feed into that information without thinking critically about what they're saying. You know, they're saying by virtue of just paying higher fees, it's a bad choice for you. But remember, the point of the mutual fund is to get you better returns than just being passive and mimicking the market. So for example, you can buy an ETF and it's got a half a percent fee and, you know, it earns 6%. Minus that half a percent, you, the investor, see a return of five and a half percent. Awesome. Or you buy a mutual fund, which has a 3% fee. But let's say, you know, they're, they're trying to beat the market and they beat it, they get a 10% return minus their 3% fee. You're left with a 7% net return, which is higher than your passive five and a half net return on the ETFs. So yeah, fees matter, but what matters most to you, the investor, is the net investment return. And when you're looking at financial reports that indicate what you know, the historical returns are, they are always net returns. They show it net of the fees. So that's what matters, you know? Use your best judgment and due diligence to actually look at, okay, how is this actually performed? Does this mutual fund perform better than the ETF? In which case, fine. I'm fine paying the higher fee because I'm getting better returns overall. Or is it underperforming? In which case it's like, well, why am I paying this fee? I might as well go passive. So again, that's not to say that every mutual fund does outperform, even though that's their goal. I'm just saying, do your due diligence. And before you bash one over the other and you want to actively compare, look at the historical returns and see what's doing better. But for the most part, if you're new to investing, you just wanna dip your toe in it for the first time, ETFs are a fantastic place to start. Because first of all, you're not having to be a stock picker. They're already a collection for you. And a lot of ETFs are the basis of things like robo-advisors such as Simple, which have, excuse me, model portfolios that they structure for you. And so there's no picking being done on your end. You just insert your money. It's already invested. It's being passively invested, mimicking an index, and you're getting returns similar to the market overall. So it's a great place to start. Kim, which investment platforms would you recommend for beginners? Awesome. So I'm going to get to a slide specifically um, comparing different routes to investing in terms of specific platforms. Truthfully, Kim, I haven't done too much research when comparing things like, okay, Wealthsimple versus Quest Trade 
or versus RBC investees or whatever it may be. But it is my personal experience and common testimonial received from those around me that Wealthsimple makes it very, very easy and straightforward and that they have constructed model portfolios that do very, very well with RBC investees um, pretty much neck and neck. It used to trail. I am now starting to feel that, sorry, I'm starting to hear that their model portfolios are outperforming the wealth simple model portfolios a bit. So those are my two best bets, wealth simple, RBC investees. Um, but you know, wealth simple is just, it's very, very straightforward. They have three different platforms within their brokerage. That's the wealth simple invest. Those are passive model ETF portfolios. Here's a wealth simple trade. That's now an opportunity for you to actually choose and pick individual stocks or individual ETFs or individual mutual funds. So you're actually yourself actively buying and selling. And they also have both simple crypto. So you can have uh, access to cryptocurrencies. You won't physically own the, the currency itself but you're own, owning an investment that is based on the value of these currencies. So if you've ever wondered about crypto, should I buy Bitcoin or not? Um, well, that's a whole other ballgame. I don't want to dive into crypto today. But all that to say is that Wealthsimple is pretty uh, comprehensive approach to any sort of investing that you want to get into. And their RB, Wealthsimple Invest platform is the most simple and intuitive way to get started with investing. So on this slide here, back to my point earlier with my clients who are like, oh yeah, no, I'm invested in, in, in TFSAs. And I'm like, okay, cool. What, what are you invested in within the TFSA? And they're like, no, 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 I'm invested in a TFSA, thinking that the TFSA is an investment. Let's remind ourselves that these are the products you can buy, mutual funds, ETFs, stocks, bonds, et cetera. And they go inside the TFSA. They go inside the RSP or inside the non-registered account. So TFSAs, RSPs, non-reg, those are types of accounts. There's no limit to how many RSPs or TFSAs you can open. Again, they're just the bucket that you put your investments within. They themselves are not an investment. So how to get started with investing. So further to your question, Kim, there are four different ways. You can start with a robo-advisor uh, and that's the best way to get started. If you would rather keep it within your own control and not pass it on to an investment manager, for example, um, using a robo-advisor allows you to be the one in control. So at any time you can add money or withdraw money without having to ask someone's permission, for example, an advisor, a middleman. So there is an algorithm which builds a portfolio suited to your risk tolerance. So when you sign up for Wealthsimple, for example, you know what, I've mentioned Wealthsimple so many times, gosh, I should be an affiliate, but I am not sponsored. So don't take this as me pushing Wealthsimple. I keep mentioning it simply due to experience. You know, my own personal experience and that of my clients, it's just been very, very approachable. So when you sign up for Wealthsimple, for example, they ask you a set of questions about your behaviors and thresholds for tolerating certain risk limits. So they'll give you some scenarios and give you a set of answers, like how would you react in a situation like this? What is the money used for? How long until you need the money? what percentage of you know, this money represents out of your whole uh, available portfolio. And based on your answers, they are able to determine what an appropriate risk threshold is for you. And then they create your model portfolio and be like, bam, there you go. This is your model portfolio. And you just keep adding money to it. And they invest it according to the portfolio they've built. There's nothing more for you to do. Very, very passive, very, very easy. And the best part, like I said, because they suss out your risk tolerance ahead of time, you don't have to worry about that either. Like, are they putting me in some risky companies or is this appropriate? That's what the questionnaire is for. So the algorithm helps determine. Uh, okay, and so I have those companies I mentioned, Wealth Simple, RBC Investees, BMO Smartfolio is another one. There's a lot up there. 
Typically with robo-advisors, uh, it's usually ETFs only. Um, each company has their own minimum, but usually there's a $0 threshold. For example, Wealth Simple, there is no minimum. Something like Quest Trade, for example, requires a $1,000 minimum. So again, very, very, very approachable. Next, we have the banks. Um, it's another option and you can get ETFs and mutual funds. Typically, they'll try to push mutual funds. But the thing with investing with your own bank, um, although they may offer a range of different products, different stocks or ETFs or mutual funds, it's typically limited to their own products that they have structured. And so they may have examples if you're with CIBC or Scotia, for example, they may have their own Scotia mutual funds that they've created for themselves, but that's what they offer and that's that. So there might be a better mutual fund out there. They can't help you. They're just limited. So they're a bit biased. They can only sell you their own products, whereas a robo advisor has everything available. So it's easy if you like the tailored advice and you want the support of a professional then this is a good route to go because it's very easy to find an advisor within your own bank. You just call them and say like, I'd like to work with an advisor and then they'll match you up to someone. But again, let's be mindful of the fact that at the bank, they are incentivized by quotas. And so that means they may not always have your best interest in mind and may select products that will be better off uh, for their own production reports. So bear that in mind. It is an unfortunate truth to working with a bank advisor versus an independent advisor, which is not captive to any one bank. These are advisors that work at their own brokerage firms. The thing is, you know, finding a good independent advisor can be challenging because you can't just walk into a bank and be like, cool, I want to work with an advisor. Um, you usually have to suss that out for yourself, whether you're searching across LinkedIn or through a referral from someone you already know, or you can even reach out to some common uh, larger um, brokerages that have independent advisors, such as um, CI Financial, uh, Freedom 55, et cetera. Uh, they have a variety of independent advisors. You can reach out to them and have yourself matched up to someone. But in general, and you know, I use this for myself as well. I used to be an independent uh, investment advisor managing money. It's something that I, I no longer do. I chose not to, but I liked it because I had the freedom to structure portfolios from various different bank products, various different investment company products. And it was dependent on what was appropriate for my clients. All that mattered is what's appropriate for you because I personally had no quotas to fill, no personal incentives to push one product over another. And so I still continue to this day when I have a client who prefers to work with an investment advisor, I will refer them to an independent advisor that I know, but it can otherwise be a little tricky to find someone who's right for you. And then finally, there's the self-guided. So this is the trickiest root. You are picking and choosing all of your own products. It is dependent on you and only you to make the right decisions here to invest appropriately according to your risk tolerance. Because unlike with a robo-advisor, although you are in control in so far as you know accessing the money, you're not in control of making the investment decisions. That's already handled for you via the algorithm set up. It is what it is. With the self-guided, you have to decide on everything for yourself. So not ideal. And at the end of the day, the next main takeaway here is that if you're new and you want to dip your toes into investing, start with a robo-advisor. And I've said the name enough times, Wealth Simple makes it so, so simple. <laughs> it's in the name uh, to get started. Um, so yeah, I hope all of this makes sense to you. It's in our name, make sense, to make money make sense for you. <laughs> so um, if you have any questions at this point, I'm sure you're probably scratching your head a little bit because that was a lot of information, but I'll be happy to uh, open it up now and I'll hand it 
back to you, Benita, as well. But if anyone has questions and wants to turn on their mic uh, to ask it, please feel free, pop it into the chats or, you know, follow up later on within the inner village and tag me and I'll be happy to chat with you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I don't see any questions coming through, um, but I think there was a lot of knowledge that you shared with us, which was definitely interesting. Um, I'm sure we all took notes. Um, but like Cindy said, she is an inner village, so you can always pop in a question in there and then she can start the conversation um, and give you resources that you can look over. Um, also, she will be putting in um, some takeaways um, soon. So that is just a recap of what we did today and just some information you can take away with you. Um, other than that, I hope you guys had a great session. Um, we do have our book club session on Sunday. So if you are free, please pop into that. Um, and other than that, enjoy your evening. And remember, you deserve to be well. Bye, everyone. Good night.